really excited about our Black History Month episode. Me too, it's kind of my favorite time of year. What I like about this episode is we're also dealing with the future, you know, Black Future. Is Black Future Month a thing? It is now. I am close to tears now, even as I say this, because it is so powerful. The reason you do all everything else is to get to the part where you can be a human being. The world's first African-American female president. <laughs> Hello and welcome to CBC Arts Exhibitionists, the only television show that puts Canadian art and Canadian artists front and center. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. For years, sci-fi movies, books, and TV shows imagined futures with flying cars, artificial intelligence, and intergalactic space travel. But these futures rarely included black people. Today, we're changing all of that. We are celebrating artists who are not only reflecting on black history, but are also imagining black futures. We begin by looking back. You've probably heard the songs. Wade in the Water, Swing Low Sweet Chariot, Go Down Moses. But did you know that they're called spirituals? They were created by generations of African Americans who were enslaved in the South. Today, spirituals are sung by choirs around the world. But does it matter who gets to sing them? Meet the choir director in Toronto who is grappling with exactly that question. The Nathaniel Deck Chorale is a 20-person ensemble. I founded the Chorale 19 years ago to be an ensemble and an organization that helped to spread the awareness of Afrocentric choral music, not only in Canada, but around the world. The spiritual is a music that was created out of the experience of slavery. It was encoded with ideas of escape and freedom. It was encoded with things that taught themselves the days of the week or the months of the year or how to count all the things that, that were supposedly forbidden in order to keep them docile and suppressed. The music that they created um, came out of that place and was really used to sing their freedom into existence. The music itself is, is invigorating, you know, and yes, sometimes I am moved to tears. I am close to tears now, even as I say this, because it is so powerful. The Yale Alumni Chorus is a group uh, primarily of people who sang in the Yale Glee Club when they were students. Spirituals have always been part of our repertoire going all the way back to the 1930s, but we haven't always thought about historical context, what it means to sing spirituals. One of the questions that we have been wrestling with this weekend is the whole question of cultural appropriation. Who should sing spirituals? Can anyone sing spirituals? And it's challenging, particularly to hear a spiritual come out of a white face. We wanted to explore that in a very in-depth way, and we thought collaborating with the Deck Chorale was the perfect way to do that. They approached me, how honest to say, we've been singing this music, and we don't really feel like we have the deepest understanding of it. And I said to them, well, um, why don't we learn together? <laughs> I think the last two or three years in the United States, a lot of people are coming to terms with the fact that the legacy of slavery is still very much with us. I certainly can't um, try to offer a quick solution to this problem that we've been struggling with for many, many decades. But as a musician, I can say that on a person-to-person -person level, uh, the more we seek to understand uh, the more that we listen on a human-to-human -human level, the better off we'll be. I think that spirituals have transcended their original creation. Whether you're black or white or anything else, if you're respectful of where this music came from and you open yourself 
to receive the uncomfortable, unsettling emotions that arise when you sing the spiritual. It changes the way you are in the world. When I hear the sound that is being created as we continue to have this discourse, I know that we have made progress and the work is not yet finished. Throughout this episode, in between each of our stories, you're gonna see some incredibly dynamic moving pictures. They were all created by our exhibitionist in residence, Amika Cooper, AKA Black Power Barbie. She's a self-taught illustrator and animator who makes images that I wish I could have on my wall. Can people have gifts on their walls? Check it out. Hi, my name is Amika Cooper, AKA Black Power Barbie, and I'm your artist in residence this week. I'm an illustrator and animator based out of Toronto, and throughout the episode, you'll be seeing some gifts of my animations. I would describe my work as a loving portrayal of Black women and other women of color, as well as an exploration of Afrofuturist themes. Okay, coming up, we have amazing creators, Sharon Lewis and Nalo Hopkinson. Oh, Nalo Hopkinson, and her writing is incredible. Have you read Brown Girl in the Ring? I definitely read it, and it changed my life. I want my life changed. So read it. Okay, and in three. Caribbean people don't often show up in science fiction and fantasy novels, but they are the heroes and villains in the writing of multi-award winning author Nalo Hopkinson. For the past 20 years, Nalo has been a trailblazer in science fiction and fantasy, and her work has often had the label Afrofuturism attached to it. Never heard of it? Here's Nalo to break it down. I'm Nalo Hopkinson. I am from Canada by way of Jamaica, Trinidad, and Guyana. I am a science fiction and fantasy writer and currently a professor of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside. Brown Girl in the Ring, oh my. I published that in 1998. You're frightened of me, don't it? Oh! I started writing the story where I had a female character who was seeing things. And then being as I write science fiction fantasy, she wasn't gonna be having illusions, they were gonna be real. I can see the spirits that walk among us. It just progressed from there. It is technically my weakest, but it's the one that people grab onto. It's the one they remember. It is what it is and I'm grateful for it. I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I watched Star Trek as much as my parents would let me. <laughs> I'm afraid you have it all wrong, Mr. Spock. And of course, uh, was drawn to characters like Mr. Spock and Duhura. I was well into my 20s when I discovered that one of my favorite writers, Samuel R. Delaney, is a black man. And that, that was a watershed moment. And that may have been when I began to realize I could do it. Oh Lord, what is Afrofuturism? Critic and scholar Mark Derry coined the term a few decades ago to talk about a trend he was seeing in African music art writing of talking about the future. Nowadays, I see the term being taken up by people who are activists and, and activist scholars because it is a radical act for black people to imagine having a future. So there's now a, a confluence of uh, Afrofuturism and uh, black activism. And then there's just the whole fun part of it as well. Black Panther's coming out as a movie, it's gonna be groundbreaking. It's already groundbreaking. The movie could suck, it doesn't matter. So there's this, this celebration of our existence, our continued existence at uh, surviving what the world does to us, at making the art we make, at, at being the political people we are. Uh, and that's, that's the fun part that is, you know, the reason you do all everything else is to get to the part where you can be a human being or be recognized as a human being because you know you already are. 
Brown Girl in the Ring by Nalo Hopkinson was the first fantasy novel I ever read with a black Caribbean girl as its hero, and it was a game changer. That novel was the inspiration for a new film by writer and director Sharon Lewis. It takes viewers to a post-apocalyptic Toronto in the year 2049. Here's Sharon to tell you more. We as black people are not placed in the future. The world that's projected in Blade Runner looks nothing like our world. Women and women of color are also in the future, and we're also in positions of power in the future. And that is exactly why we've done the movie Brown Girl Begins. No matter how boar hide under sheep's wool and grunt still betray him. Um, translation. In the world of Brown Girl Begins, the film, all the wealthy have fled to downtown Toronto. There's no electricity, there's no water, there's no politicians. And the poor have been marginalized and sent to an island. Hey, 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 hey what's the rule? We don't steal from anyone that helps us. The whole political idea of Afrofuturism stems all the way back from the 60s and the 70s and the nationalist movement in terms of how do we bring Africa to where we are and how do we um, think about Africa, the motherland, in a futuristic kind of way. For me, Afrofuturism is much more simple. It's more how are we going to see black people in the future and how can we place black people in the future? So for me, when I did Brown Girl Begins, it was all about placing a young, black, Caribbean woman in the future in a position of power. If we're looking back and we're looking at Black History Month, we're looking at us in terms of our shared experience in a position of oppression and revolution and fighting back, but, but mostly the mainstream tends to look at us in oppression and Afrofuturism for me is a movement that looks at us as a movement of putting ourselves in the future, putting ourselves in the future, not depending on anybody else, and in a position of power. I don't want to kill a chosen one. I want to give you the power that you are meant to have. Then give me the power to see. My idea of what it'll be like for artists in the future black artists in the future in Toronto is that we're still going to have the same challenges of racism and sexism in the sense that those barriers aren't going to disappear because then I would be talking about a fantasy and I deal with sci-fi not fantasy but what I do think is that there will be more stories and more access to those stories than we have now and I think that the idea of multiple identities in the black community rather than one monolithic African-American uh, stereotype, black identity, there'll be multiple and diverse identities that are accepted. That's all you got, baby girl? I think if I had seen this film when I was growing up, that it wouldn't have taken me so long to think it was okay to tell my stories. I'm so excited. Look who's coming up next. Ah, uh, Lena Waithe. Remember how starstruck we were when we were filming this? so geeked out. I think I was just as geeky, okay. <laughs> okay, and in three. There's an amazing thing happening in Canadian music right now. From the Colombian Canadian singer Lido Pimienta to the up and coming Somali Canadian beat maker Abuxum, diasporic artists are combining their traditional music with modern sounds to create something completely fresh. Pierre Quenders is one of them. He fuses Congolese and electronic music to create a sonic passport that allows his listeners to travel across borders. Take a look.
uh, we're going to uh, this Congolese restaurant called La Firenze. And it's, it's a little bit of a, to, just to have a taste of uh, back home, you know, you reminiscing from home. It's like, I remember when I was a kid, you would go out with your parents sitting on a terrace and eating goat and drinking some soda. It's a good feeling. The latest record is Makanda at the end of space, the beginning of Thai. Makanda means strength in Chiluba, which is one of the languages from Congo. And uh, with this record, I just wanted to be more of myself and showcase more of uh, the African music part of myself. Like I mentioned before, you know, I wanted to be this type of bridge between African music and the rest of the world. And uh, with it, I wanted everybody to feel like they were traveling, you know, traveling through Africa, traveling through any place in the world and feel comfortable in listening into it, feeling something out of it. And it's also the most personal of my two uh, albums. In this album, in particular in Makanda, I sing in uh, three different languages, which are French, English, and Lingala. Montreal is pretty much the reason why I'm doing the, the music that I'm doing right now, because you just feel it's a city full of uh, diversity. I'm born in Kinshasa, I've been raised there, and I've, I was surrounded by the Congolese music, you know, it can be traditional Congolese Zumba. I was surrounded with that music, and moving into Canada, I grew up here, and I've discovered new, new music, new type of music, new genre that I liked. And within my music, what I try to do is just to represent who I am. And who I am is that kid who was surrounded by Congolese Rumba half of his life and came here, discovered some other stuff. Personally, I'm proud to be part of the, the African diaspora. And I think I, I do my best to represent it well. And nowadays, I see more and more young uh, African like me uh, coming out and uh, just trying to promote more, you know, to, to be more connected to uh, the roots, uh, their African roots, and trying to, to promote it here as well. Because we are African, whether we like it or not, we will always be African. And living here, in order to live here peacefully, in order to uh, uh, to live here, we have to accept our, where we come from, you know, in order to be at ease where we are now. Some people study history, other people make it. Lena Waithe makes history. For her work on the show Master of None, she became the first black woman to win an Emmy for comedy writing. She's also the creator of the new hit drama The Shy, and she's starring in the upcoming Steven Spielberg film Ready Player One. Like I said, Lena Waithe makes history. I got a chance to fangirl over her and ask her some rapid fire questions in our cultural speed round. Take a look. So you've created a new series called The Shy. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Series. Can you describe the show to us in exactly one sentence? Uh, the Shy is about what it means to be black, human, and living on the south side of Chicago. So you grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So let me know, what's the best song to listen to while driving through the streets of Chicago when I go? Ooh, um, We All We Got. Chance the Rapper. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose, Chance or Kanye? I love Chance so much, but Kanye has left such a huge fingerprint on the music industry, on the culture. And even if Chance was here, I think he'd agree. He, yeah. he would say Kanye. Okay. The song that you are embarrassed to love? Kelly Clarkson's first single. What was that called? Since you've been gone. I remember that video like it was a thing. I might have been crushing too. Okay. <laughs> Guilty pleasure TV show. My lovely fiance enjoys all the Real Housewives. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan, but I don't have a choice because happy soon to be wife, happy life. TV writer whose career you most admire? Donald Glover, Sorkin, Shonda. Best book on the craft of writing? Raquel, what's the name of the book? Um, Anatomy of Story. Anatomy of Story. Story. <laughs> Last movie that made you cry? The Florida Project. Mm. And Call Me By Your Name as well. You're in Steven Spielberg's upcoming film, Ready Player One. Yeah. What is your favorite Spielberg movie of all time? That's difficult. I'll be cliche and say The Color Purple. 
Okay, and why? I just really appreciate the beauty in the film, Whoopi's performance, and the kiss between Celie and Jude. Mm -hmm. Live-in single character that you'd want with you during a zombie apocalypse. Wow. <laughs> Khadijah. Khadijah's gonna figure it out. But Maxine would come with the punchlines in the midst of the zombie apocalypse. Maxine would want to know where the food is. <laughs> it's true. And Regine, you know, would definitely... Regine's not helpful, no. You know, she could be my girl, though. Yeah. She will be my girl. <laughs> So Angela Bassett played your mom in the Emmy Award winning episode of Master of None. Here's the hypothetical question. Okay. You have Angela Bassett as your lead, no limit to your budget. What's the log line of this film? The world's first African American female president. Thank you so much for doing it. Thank I love your show, so I love you. I watch your speech like weekly. Thank you, that means <laughs> a lot to me. If there's an artist you think should be on CBC Arts Exhibitionists, let us know. Send us a message on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Our handle is at CBC Arts. I'll be back next time with even more artists from Chatham to Preston. Until then, keep creating and innovating. Peace. Awesome show, way to Thank go. You. I am loving this Black Thank Future you. outfit. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like Star Wars. Uh, more Star Trek, I'd say. Uh, Star Wars is better, so you should what? take a compliment. You're not serious. Yeah, Star Wars is like it has diversity. You know. Oh come on, Jackson, Star Rose Wars got diverse in like the last ten years. Star okay. Trek has been diverse since the beginning, since 1966. Original cast: Mr. Sulu, uh -huh. Uhura. Come on now. Okay, Person but you know kiss. what? Star Wars has lightsabers. Star Trek has teleportation. Beat me up, Scotty. Amanda? Beat me up, Scotty, too. Nothing. Just hang on.